traditional as we hold hands and flags in the pride parade, the same flags that colonized South Asia and stole our colors and put them in a rainbow that they now fly over our lands with their drones and British Airways tourists who only dance in our clubs, I mean, who only were able to dance in our clubs because we shot their sodomy, we shed their sodomy laws like we shed their clothes, let them in our bodies like we let them in our countries, Om Namah Shivaya. So we went home and renamed our ancestors homophobic. So we recited your shlokas, make me prouder, make me lighter, make me beautiful, castrate culture, castrate history, castrate India, castrate brown, castrate queer. The British imposed sodomy laws on India. Thousand year old temples depicting same sex intimacy were forgotten. And we've been watching the white man stick us on our backs and put himself inside of us since. Um, I, I actually just want to raise up some of the things that Sonia was talking about uh, like really recently about how 377 I think has been elevated to this global stage and has um, I think been portrayed in a lot of particular media as some sort of judgment on queer people and gender non-conforming people. Um, but I want us to keep in mind, like, those who are most affected by criminalization and brutality, that's not just a result of 377, but a whole host of, you know, just the police doing what they do, which is criminalize gender non-conforming, poor, trans, people of color, um, and Dalit and Adivasi people in India. So I am especially in solidarity today with those folks. Um, and I hope that we can think beyond the category of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender as the ones that we're organizing around, right? Um, to more broadly how the Global South is always this site that is called out as backwards or savage, etc. Um, and that this law, if we're thinking about it critically, is one that, as Alok was saying, is a relic of colonial legacy. Um, and so that's what we're trying to fight back against, not just the Indian state or state repression, right, but like a much broader global system of control and domination over sexuality and gender. And I just want to add um, a note about implementation. Like, I think it's really great that we rolled out uh, when the state decides a judgment, but why aren't we there when folks are tortured in prison? Why aren't we there when folks are raped in the home? Um, we need to really extend our analysis away of state violence from just talking about legislation. Section 377 was never about upper caste, urban, middle class gay men even though they may dominate the narrative. Section 377 is about working class queer people. It's about female assigned people at birth. And unless we have an analysis of casteism, of patriarchy, of neo-colonialism, we can't ever think about what it would look like to build queer liberation. So I'm really glad that we're gathered here today for this issue. It's not enough. Um, and we need to continue to support and make linkages between multinational corporations and queer people. Make linkages between the displacements of thousands of indigenous people and queer people. These are queer people too. Queer people are not just middle class, upper caste, urban, gay men. Uh, we have two more poems we'd like to close with you on, but thanks for having us. When I tell my mother how long I have been sitting with the shiftiness of a female body, she cries a million kind of monsoon tears. She tells me about the white men who colonized her land, her nightmares, her mother's sorry soaked in salt water, the trauma she screamed about. And this, this is the face I remember when I speak to white trans men and witness the million different ways they take up space in my community and speak for trans women of color and treat femmes as arm candy and do not own their position as white men, brothers, 